Welcome everybody to the set theory seminar. Um, so today it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Chris Lambie Hansen from the Czech Academy of Sciences, and he's going to speak about squares, ultra filters, and forcing axioms. Go ahead. All right. So yeah, thank you for the invitation to speak here, and thank you all for being here. Um, yeah. So I'm going to talk about squares, ultra filters, and forcing axioms. So this is some uh, recent joint work that I've done with Asaf Reno and Jin Zhang. Um, of course, if you have any questions throughout the talk, please don't hesitate to interrupt to ask either by voice or, or in the chat, which I think I should be able to see. OK, so let me start by giving the sort of basic uh, definition that will be interesting to us today. So the most basic definition for us is the following. Uh, we have a uniform ultra filter U over some cardinal kappa, it's at least uh, omega two. Uh, we say that U is indecomposable uh, if it has the following property. So whenever we have some lambda strictly less than kappa, and we have a function F from kappa to lambda, uh, there is a measure one set A in our ultra filter, such that the pointwise image of A under F uh, is countable. Okay. So in other words, whenever we sort of partition kappa into fewer than kappa many pieces, the union of countably many of those is large in our ultra filter. Um, note one particular consequence of this uh, if u is indecomposable and lambda is some regular uncountable cardinal less than kappa, then uh, whenever we have some sequence a alpha or alpha less than lambda that is decreasing with respect to the subset relation uh, and each a alpha is in our ultra filter U, uh, then the intersection of all of the A alphas is in U. Okay. Good. So, indecomposability can thus be seen as a natural weakening of kappa completeness. This is sort of a, a restricted form of completeness. Um, in this first part of the definition, uh, if we were able to find some A uh, such that the pointwise image of A under F had size one, then that would precisely be kappa completeness. And here we can just shrink to some countable set. Um, also, like, why are we interested in, e in decomposability? Well, it was first actually studied by, by some model theorists. It was introduced, I believe, by Kiesler. Um, and it has some important consequences for ultra powers. So let me just give one, there are lots, this isn't by no means the most important, uh, but just to illustrate its importance, uh, this is a fact that I believe is due to prickery. Uh, if U is some indecomposable ultra filter over some strong limit cardinal kappa, then for every infinite cardinal mu less than kappa, uh, if we look at the size of the image of mu under the ultra power embedding, which is this set here, the product of mu mod the ultra filter u. Um, this has relatively small size. Its size is at most two to the mu, right? And mu here could be quite small compared to the, the kappa on which the ultra filter lives. So this is much smaller than it could possibly be. Okay. Now, there are, are two situations in which a cardinal of kappa sort of obviously carries an indecomposable ultra filter. Uh, the first is simply if kappa is a measurable cardinal, right? Then it carries a kappa complete ultra filter, which is therefore indecomposable. Uh, there's a slightly less trivial uh, case, though. Um, so the second situation is the situation in which kappa is a limit, in fact, a singular limit of countably many measurable cardinals. Okay, so let me briefly outline why kappa carries an indecomposable ultra filter in this case. So let's let 
kappa m or m less than omega be an increasing sequence of measurable cardinals converging to kappa. Uh, for each n, let un um, be a kappa n complete ultra filter over kappa n and let w be a non-principal ultra filter over omega. And now define an ultra filter u over kappa by the following. So if a is some subset of kappa, then a is in u, if and only if the set of n for which a intersect kappa n is in un is in w. Right? So we're essentially just sort of averaging over these uh, measures un for n less than omega. Right? Uh, and you can check, I'll leave it as an exercise, that uh, this resulting ultra filter u, of course it's not complete, kappa is a singular cardinal, uh, but it is an indecomposable ultra filter over kappa. Okay, so these are kind of the two situations in which kappa, for almost trivial reasons, carries an indecomposable ultra filter. Uh, so one question you could ask is whether these are the only cases there are. And this is, this is a question that was in a sense asked by Silver many years ago. So Silver really asked the following question, which is sort of a weakening of this. He asked, suppose kappa is some inaccessible cardinal carrying an indecomposable ultra filter, must kappa be measurable? Um, in the 1980s, Michael Sheard proved that the answer is no. Um, so I, I should say, uh, in terms of consistency strength, uh, this question sort of has a positive answer, right? Um, the consistency of a cardinal carrying an indecomposable ultra filter implies the consistency of the existence of a measurable cardinal. But just in terms of the existence, it's not a direct implication. So Sheard in particular proved that uh, con ZFC plus there exists a measurable cardinal implies con ZFC plus there is some inaccessible cardinal kappa, such that kappa carries an indecomposable ultra filter, but kappa is not measurable. And in fact, it's not even weakly compact. Um, I'll say a little bit about how to prove this in just a minute. But first, I want to mention that there is still an open question here. So this kappa in Shear's model was sort of necessarily not weakly compact. It's open whether this is sort of necessary for this situation to hold. So this question is actually sort of surprisingly open. Uh, if kappa is weakly compact and carries an indecomposable ultra filter, then must it be measurable? Um, one reason that you might think yes is that there's actually a partial answer in this direction. So by a uh, theorem of Kettenen, uh, it must be Ramsey. So any weakly compact cardinal carrying an indecomposable ultra filter is Ramsey. Um, so the question is, can we do better and prove that it must be measured? So this is still open. OK, so let me say a few words about how to prove Sheard's theorem. I'm going to outline a proof that is not Sheard's original proof. Uh, it's a proof that is, is due to us with, with Renaud and John, um, but it's very similar in spirit to Sheard's original proof. And I want to give a definition that will be relevant to us. And this is the definition of something called an indexed square principle. So for this particular principle, I want to fix uh, infinite regular cardinals uh, theta less than kappa. Then by uh, this expression, square in kappa theta, uh, this asserts the existence of a certain matrix, C alpha i, for alpha a limit ordinal below kappa, and i some ordinal between i of alpha and theta. Here, i of alpha is always some ordinal below theta, and it depends on alpha. 
uh, with the following properties. So first of all, for all limit ordinals alpha less than kappa, if we just look at this matrix for a fixed alpha, so we look at C alpha I for I of alpha less than I less than theta, this is a subset uh, increasing sequence of clubs in alpha. Okay, so for all large enough i, we're given some clubs, the alpha i in alpha, and these are either increasing uh, as i increases. Okay, second, um, not only are these clubs increasing, but they essentially cover all the limit ordinals below alpha. Namely, for all, let's say, alpha less than beta, both in lim kappa, there exists some large enough i, so it's in the interval from i beta to theta, such that alpha is a limit point of the club c beta i. Um, now, part of the reason the second condition is important is that the third condition implies some coherence here. So it applies for all alpha less than beta in lim kappa for all i in the interval from i beta to theta. If alpha is a limit point of the club c beta i, Uh, then C alpha I is equal to C beta I intersecting with alpha. And in particular, this implies that uh, I of alpha is less than or equal to I. Okay, so we have coherence along the columns here for any fixed I. Um, okay, Chris, and finally, uh, Chris? like any square sequence, there should be some non-triviality requirement and that non-triviality requirement is the following. Uh, there is no club D in kappa such that for every limit point alpha of D, there exists some I such that D intersected with alpha equals C alpha. Okay, so this is a sort of incompactness principle. Um, we have clubs like this in every uh, ordinal beta less than kappa, uh, but no such uh, clubs all the way up in kappa. Okay, now there is a natural forcing that I'll call P kappa lambda that adds a witness to this index square principle by closed initial segments. Right, I just want to add uh, sort of a, an initial segment of a matrix that looks like this, that satisfies all of these properties locally, except for four. Four will just happen uh, automatically by genericity. Okay, and uh, the theorem we proved, which is uh, sort of a, a different version of the same theorem that Sheard proved in the 1980s, uh, is the following. It says that if kappa is measurable, and its measurability is indestructible, uh, we just need indestructibility for adding a single Cohen subset to kappa. So this doesn't add any consistency strength. You can always arrange this for a measurable cardinal. Then, after doing this forcing to add this index square principle, uh, actually, let me um, say something less general, but more concrete. Um, I just want to add a square sequence of width omega in here. Um, kappa carries an indecomposable 
ultra filter. Okay. Um, if you vary the width of the sequence and force with say p kappa theta for some different theta, you would get an, an ultra filter with some weaker in decomposability uh, properties. Um, but just for concreteness here, I'll focus on on this case. So we're adding this index per sequence of width omega, and in the extension, kappa still carries an in decomposable ultra filter. It's obviously not weakly compact here because this square principle holds there. In particular, there's some kappa Aaron chain tree that you can read off of the square sequence. All right, so this is one way of sort of seeing the, the truth of Shear's theorem. Okay. Uh, however, adding these index square principles sort of wreaks a lot of havoc on the on the universe. In particular, uh, if uh, index square, say kappa omega holds, then this all of a sudden uh, implies that, for instance, there are no uh, strongly compact cardinals below kappa. Uh, it also implies, for instance, that PFA must fail. Okay. Um, and in fact, in quite a remarkable theorem recently, uh, Gabe Goldberg was able to prove that actually, if you assume that there exist strongly compact cardinals, then Silver's question actually has a positive answer above those strongly compact cardinals. Uh, more precisely, he proved the following theorem. And in fact, he proved it more general than this, but I'm going to just for simplicity, focus on this uh, particular case. So uh, four or five years ago, uh, he proved the following. Suppose that mu is some strongly compact cardinal and kappa greater than mu carries an indecomposable ultra filter, then it must do so for one of the trivial reasons we saw before. Right? So either kappa is measurable or kappa is a limit of countably many measurable cardinals. Okay. And this is sort of a, a general theme in the study of large cardinals and, and combinatorial set theory, is that in general, all sorts of chaos can happen in the, the world of set theory, but things look a lot nicer above a strongly compact cardinal. Things are much more regular and more predictable um, above a strongly compact than they are in general. And this is another instance of, of that happening. Um, another sort of common narrative uh, in combinatorial set theory involves a sort of sort of two-step process uh, in which uh, first some combinatorial principle uh, is proven to hold above a strongly compact or super compact cardinal. And then later on, the same principle is shown to hold, let's say, above omega 2, assuming the proper forcing axiom. or PFA. Okay, so a, a common refrain here is that uh, in models of PFA, omega-2 often behaves in many ways like a strongly compact or super compact cardinal. Um, so just some quick examples. Uh, Solove proves the following theorems. Uh, if lambda is strongly compact, then uh, first of all, the singular cardinals hypothesis, SCH, holds above lambda. Um, and he also proved, maybe not in exactly this language, uh, uh, the square of kappa fails for all regular kappa above lambda. Um, and later on, both of these were also shown to hold from PFA. So Fiale proved that PFA implies the singular cardinal's hypothesis. 
and Tenorchevich proved that BFA uh, implies square of kappa fails for all regular kappa, at least on my continuum. Okay. Um, and in fact, in both of these cases, the full power of PFA is obviously not needed. Um, there are these combinatorial consequences of PFA that were shown to be sufficient. And to a certain extent, we'll see a similar thing with the result that we're going to talk mostly about today. Okay, so uh, the three of us, uh, Asaf, Jin, and I, um, were sort of thinking about indecomposable ultrafilters and came across this result of Goldberg and asked ourselves the question if a similar sort of thing happened here, right? Namely, does the same conclusion from Goldberg's theorem hold uh, assuming PFA? Um, and we were able to give a positive answer to this, right? So here's the theorem that I want to mostly talk about today. So suppose that the proper forcing axiom holds uh, and kappa, at least omega 2, carries an indecomposable ultrafilter, then either one kappa is measurable or two kappa is the limit of constantly many measurable cardinals. So again, uh, kappa can only carry an indecomposable ultrafilter if it does for sort of the trivial reasons. Okay, uh, so just as with, with these results up here, we're not going to apply the proper forcing axiom in terms of finding some proper forcing and meeting a bunch of dense sets. Instead, we're going to apply directly some combinatorial principle that is known to follow from PFA. And this principle is the existence of what are called guessing models. Um, so I want to uh, introduce and review some of the basic properties uh, of guessing models. So first we need some definitions. Uh, these definitions in some sense go back to uh, the work of Hamptons with uh, approximation and uh, covering properties. Uh, these specific definitions are, I'd say, due to um, Biala and Weiss. So building all these definitions of Hamptons. Okay, so let's suppose that theta is some large regular cardinal. Um, N is some elementary substructure of H theta. Typically for us, N will be of size L1. Uh, and X is some element of N. Uh, and let's fix some subset D of X. Uh, D is not necessarily an element of M, it's just a subset of some element of M. Now we say that D is N approximated if for every countable set Z in N, uh, we have D intersected with Z. Is in N. So you can think of this as sort of saying that, okay, maybe D is not itself an element of N, but all of its small pieces are in N. At least all of its small pieces that N could possibly know about are, are in N. Okay. Uh, we also say that D is N guessed if there is some set E. Is actually an element of N, such that as far as N is concerned, E looks exactly like D. So uh, in other words, E intersect N equals D intersect N. Okay, so again, we're not necessarily saying that D is an element of N, uh, but there is some element of N that at least as far as N is uh, concerned, behaves just like D. Uh, and finally, we say that N is a guessing model if every set that is N approximated is N guessed. Okay. So in other words, uh, every set that's a subset of some element of N, if N sees all of its small pieces, then N sees not necessarily that set, but some set that behaves just like it. 
as far as that is concerned. Okay, and now the Jessine model property, which we abbreviate GMP, is the assertion that there are a lot of Jessine models, and more particularly, a lot of Jessine models of size Aleph 1. Uh, so more formally, is the assertion that for all large uh, regular theta, the set of Jessine models is stationary in P omega 2 of H theta. So in other words, for all X in H theta, there's some elementary submodel of H theta such that X is in N, cardinality of N, uh, is omega one, and n is a Jessen model. Okay, so this was introduced by uh, Viale and Weiss in their paper uh, studying the consistency strength of the proper forcing axiom. Uh, they typically did not call it by this uh, acronym. Um, in particular because uh, this is actually equivalent to uh, a, a, a two cardinal tree property that is usually referred to as ISP omega two. So for those of you who have maybe seen that before, let me just note that GMP is the same as ISP omega two, which is a statement about uh, two cardinal trees. I'm not going to talk about this directly, so I won't I won't define this, but if you've seen it before, then they're the same. So Vialli and Weiss proved that PFA implies GMP. And in the years since then, it's been shown that GMP in fact suffices for many of the applications of PFA. For instance, both of the ones we've seen so far already, uh, the singular cardinal hypothesis and the failure of square uh, are both cons consequences of GMP. Uh, however, notably, uh, unlike PFA, GMP does not imply that the continuum is small. Uh, so PFA implies that two to the omega is omega two, but GMP is compatible with any value of the continuum that's at least omega two. It's not compatible with CH, but any larger value it's compatible with. Um, in fact, uh, GMP is always indestructible under adding any number of color rings. Okay, so I want to at least sketch a proof of, of this main theorem here that PFA suffices to get the conclusion of Goldberg's theorem. Uh, I first want to review some basic facts about indecomposable ultrafilters. So these are facts that mostly go back to the, the early days of the study uh, of indecomposable ultrafilters. Uh, a lot of this work was done by Kiesler, uh, Kuhnen, and Brickery. Uh, so first of all, I want to put a limit on what sorts of ultrafilters are possibly able to carry indecomposable, sorry, what cardinals can possibly carry indecomposable ultrafilters. So first of all, uh, Kuhnen and Prickery showed that no successor of a regular cardinal can ever carry an indecomposable ultrafilter. Right. Uh, then Prickery showed that if SCH holds, and lambda is a singular strong limit cardinal, then lambda plus uh, does not carry an indecomposable ultrafilter. Okay. Uh, so for the most part here, since we're going to be working under PFA and so SCH holds, uh, with the exception of some sort of annoying cases we have to think about here, um, this is going to say that we can focus mostly on limit cardinals, kappa. Um, good. So uh, before I, I give the next basic fact, I want to give just a restatement of the definition of being indecomposable. So this is really just a rewriting of the definition. A uniform ultrafilter U over a cardinal kappa is indecomposable if and only if the following holds. 
for all lambda less than kappa, for all f function from kappa to lambda, there is a function b from kappa to omega. And there is a function g from omega to lambda such that f is equal at least when restricted to some measure one set uh, to the composition of g and phi. Okay, this is a slightly obtuse way of writing the original definition. Um, it's much harder to parse, uh, but if you think about it, this is exactly what, what it's saying, right? Um, remember the original definition, if we had this function f, then we could find some measure one set A uh, such that uh, the pointwise image of A under F is countable. And now we just take this countable range, map it to omega, and then you know take the pre-image of that map as, as this uh, uh, this G. All right. Uh, and this gives us uh, what we have here, right? But the reason I'm writing this sort of more obtuse version of the definition is that uh, Silver proved this remarkable theorem that we can actually switch the order of quantifiers in this statement. And we can find a single function phi that simultaneously works for all lambda and all f. So this is the same with the next theorem. Just to restate this, Silver proved that at least if kappa is large enough, this choice of phi can be chosen independently of f. So the theorem formally says the following, kappa just needs to be greater than two to the omega one. And suppose that such kappa carries an indecomposable ultra filter, then there exists a single function phi from kappa to omega, such that for all less lambda less than kappa, uh, for all f from kappa to lambda, there exists g for omega to lambda, such that f equals g composed with phi on a measure one set. Um, there's actually a really nice proof of this theorem. I unfortunately I don't think I, I want to take the time to to do it here, but I encourage you all to to find the proof of this. It's it's quite nice and sort of surprising, I think. Um, a proof can essentially be found in in Goldberg's paper where where he proves this theorem about the strongly compact. Okay, but now we have all the tools we need to at least sketch a proof of this main theorem. Okay, so, so here's our, our stretch. So remember what the situation is. We're assuming that the proper forcing axiom holds um, and kappa at least omega two carries an indecomposable ultra filter U. Uh, so we, we first apply Silver's theorem that we just mentioned and we fix this single function phi from kappa to omega such that for all lambda less than kappa, for all f from kappa to lambda, there's a g permitted to lambda, such that f equals g composed with the uh, mod u. Now I'm going to use this function from kappa to omega to project the ultra filter u onto an ultra filter on omega. Right, so I'm going to let d be phi star of u, the root and Kiesler projection of u. So in other words, U is an ultra filter uh, on omega defined by. I mean, P is an ultra filter on omega, right? Uh, D, yes, thank you very much. D is an ultra filter on omega uh, defined by axes in D if and only if. 
uh, the pre-image of D under phi uh, is in U. Pre-image of X. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this, this is hopefully correct now. Um, very good. Um, so notice that it, it could have been the case uh, that this ultra filter U we started with was not only indecomposable, uh, but was uh, Kappa complete. Um, in that case, our, our theorem is, is easy because then Kappa is just measurable, right? So in the non-trivial case, we can assume uh, that U is not a uh, Kappa complete ultra filter, in particular, it's not going to be countably complete. Because for an indecomposable ultra filter, being Kappa complete is the same as being countably complete. So U is not going to be countably complete, uh, and therefore this D is going to be a non principal ultra filter. Um, it's not really relevant for the arguments, but I think it makes sense clear just to have this uh, in mind that this D will be a, a non principal ultra filter to make things sort of non trivial. Okay. Now uh, we're going to consider the ultra power maps induced by these two ultra filters. We have JD, which is the ultra power map with respect to D from M from V to MD, uh, and JU from V to MU. Now these ultra filters, of course, are not countably complete. So these ultra powers are not going to be well founded. And so in the arguments in this theorem, uh, you have to be careful to keep this in mind when, when doing the arguments. Um, we're mostly going to ignore that during this talk because I'll, I won't be going in depth into many of the details, but uh, I just want to mention that you do have to keep in mind that these are uh, non-well-founded uh, ultra powers. Okay, um, however, there is going to be a map, okay, from MD to MU uh, defined as follows. So remember that the, the elements of MD we can think of as equivalence classes G, D, where G is some function uh, from omega to V. So uh, what does K do with such a class, class of G? It sends it to the following. Uh, you consider the composition uh, G composed with phi, apply J of U to this, and then evaluate this uh, on the class of the identity function from kappa to kappa. Okay. So you can check, I'm not going to go through the, the verification here, but you can check that this K uh, is elementary. And uh, the diagram commutes. That would be uh, J, D, MD, J, U, MU, and here we have K. Okay. All right, so we have this sort of factor map K that takes us from MD to Uh, moreover, uh, for all lambda less than kappa, if we look at what this map K does on the ordinals of MD that are below JD of lambda, it's essentially the identity. So it maps these ordinals onto some initial segment of the ordinals of MU. And in fact, that initial segment is precisely uh, JU of lambda. Okay. Um, this is exactly because of uh, these magical properties of this function phi uh, that we isolated, right? Because what is this phi doing? It's saying that any ordinal that lies here below j u of lambda is represented by some function from kappa to lambda. And what phi is doing is it's saying for any such function f, um, I can actually find a function g 
from a lambda to lambda, that's essentially the same as it. It has the same information uh, after composing with, with phi modulo the ultra filter. Uh, and so all of the ordinals below J U of lambda and M U essentially have corresponding ordinals below J D of lambda and M D. And those are just mapped to the, the corresponding places. Uh, so it follows in particular that if we have any set sigma in MD, such that MD thinks that the cardinality of sigma is less than JD of lambda for some lambda less than kappa, then K of lambda is exactly the, the pointwise image um, of, or sorry, K of sigma is the pointwise image of sigma under K. Okay. Pretty good. Okay, so uh, now that we have this factor map K, uh, we can define uh, an MD ultra filter W over JD of kappa as follows. So first, before I define this, what do I mean by an MD ultra filter? Um, I mean that W is going to measure um, all of the sets that MD thinks are subsets of JD of kappa. And we're going to define W as follows. So given some A in MD, uh, that's a subset of JD of kappa, we need to say whether or not it's in W. Uh, we let A be in W if and only if when we look at K of A, so this is now in MU going to be a subset of JU of kappa. Uh, we can ask whether the class of the identity function on kappa is in this set. And if it is, then we put our set in our ultra filter W. Okay, so we're using the identity function as sort of a seed uh, to define this ultra filter. Okay, now, by these properties of K that we saw above, by the fact that it's sort of the identity on all of these small ordinals, this tells us that this ultra filter W is highly complete. Right? Uh, in other words, uh, W is it's called MD JD of lambda complete for all lambda less than kappa. So what does this mean precisely? This means that if, uh, a is some sequence in MD. So MD thinks that it's some sequence. Uh, and it's a sequence of elements of W. And M thinks that the length of this sequence less than JD of lambda, uh, then the intersection of the sequence is also in W. Okay. So one thing I want to immediately note is the following. If we got really lucky and this ultra filter W we're actually an element of our ultra power MD, then we'd be done by elementarity. We'd be done because uh, MD would think the following. For all lambda less than kappa, MD would think W is a JD of lambda complete ultra filter over JD of kappa. Uh, and now we have two possibilities. So the first possibility uh, is that uh, the profanality of kappa uh, is greater than omega. In this case, if you look at the soup, of the pointwise image of kappa under JD, then this is kappa. Right, this ultra power value is going to be continuous uh, at say ordinals of profanality kappa. 
And therefore, since MD thinks that this ultra filter is JD of lambda complete for all lambda less than kappa, it follows by this continuity uh, that MB thinks that W is JD kappa complete. And so then just by elementarity, V thinks there is some kappa complete ultra filter over kappa. So kappa is measurable. Okay, uh, the other possibility is both kappa equals omega. Um, but now we just sort of directly apply uh, elementarity to this statement, right? Then for all lambda less than kappa, by elementarity, V thinks there's this a lambda complete ultra filter. Uh, over kappa, the completeness of this ultra filter must be a measurable cardinal. And since kappa is singular, it must be less than kappa. So kappa is a limited measurable cardinals. Right. So we have our, our two cases here. Okay. Uh, however, in general, there's no reason to think that W lies in MD. Right. It was defined entirely externally to MD. So there's no reason to think it will be there. Um, however, again, by the fact that K uh, is sort of the identity on all these small ordinals, uh, this implies that all of the small pieces uh, are in W. Or, sorry, all of the small pieces of W are in MD. So in particular, uh, we have the following lemma. Suppose that lambda less than kappa is such that two to the lambda is less than kappa, then for all x in V, of size less than or equal to lambda, if I look at W intersected with JD of x, this small piece of the ultra filter is actually an element of MD. Okay, so already you might be sort of seeing how guessing models might be relevant here, right? We have this set W. Um, we have all of its sort of small pieces in a certain meaning lying in this model MD. And it'd be great if we could include that the whole set lied in MD. Okay, um, we weren't actually able to prove that. We don't actually know if that's true or not. Uh, it might be. Um, we weren't able to show that, but we were able to sort of uh, get almost there. So I want to sort of stretch how the rest of this argument um, goes, at least to a certain extent. So how do we actually use this fact that looks like some sort of approximation property? Uh, okay, so let's let theta be some sufficiently large regular cardinal. Um, and let's consider an arbitrary guessing model. Remember, we're assuming PFA, so we're assuming GMP. And suppose we have some guessing model N. It's an elementary sum model of H theta of size omega 1. Okay, now PFA holds, so 2 to the omega 1 is omega 2, so kappa is certainly greater than 2 to the omega 1. So we can apply this lemma to say that uh, W intersect JD of N is in MD. So what we can do is we can fix some function that represents it there. We can fix some function F sub N from omega to N intersect the power side of the power side of kappa such that uh, Fn represents W intersected with JD of N in the ultra power. Okay. Uh, now, we can assume a couple of things by elementarity, right? So we have sort of a, a Walsh's theorem here. Um, we know that W intersect JD of N is sort of a, a JD of N ultra filter over uh, JD of kappa. So by elementarity, uh, we can assume that uh, for all N less than omega, F sub capital N of N 
is an ultra filter on n intersect the power set of kappa. So it measures all the subsets of kappa that are in n. And moreover, we can assume that this ultra filter fn of n is n omega 1 complete, right? Uh, we can't really do much better than this uh, because uh, we need the relevant ordinal here to actually be a subset of n uh, to say that any sequence of that length that's in our model n is actually a subset of the model, right? Uh, but we have that here. So we definitely assume that uh, this fn of n is at least countably complete with respect to countable sequences that are in them. Okay. So now let, let uh, theta star be some large irregular cardinal. Let m be a guessing model. It's an elementary sum model of h theta star. Uh, and let y be m intersect h theta. So y itself will still be a, a guessing model, just the intersection of m with h theta. And now note that for all x in p omega 2 of h theta intersect m, uh, we have x as a subset of y. So just sort of trivially, if we look at our ultra filter w intersected with x, this is the same as w intersect y intersect x. And so again, by sort of a Wash's theorem, this implies that the set B sub x of n less than omega, such that f x of n equals f y of n intersected with x. This must be in our ultra filter D. Okay, so we're now ready for, for sort of the, the key claim, at least for the part of the proof that I'm going to sketch today. So my claim is that we have this dressing model M. I have these sort of uh, omega many things that are ultra filters over N intersect P kappa. And I want it to be the case that most of these are N approximated. So the precise claim is that if I look at the set of all n less than omega, such that f y of n is m approximated, uh, this is in our ultra filter D. Particular, it's infinite. Okay, so let me stretch a, a proof of this claim. So let's uh, uh, suppose not. So for all n, in omega outside of x, what does it mean that f y of n is not m approximated? This means there is a countable z n in m uh, such that f y of n intersected with z n is not an element of M. Okay. Now, a property that I have not mentioned yet, but it's very crucial, is that uh, guessing models are what's called internally unbounded. In other words, for every Countable set, um, I will call it A of M that's sort of bounded. So A is a subset of some X in M. Uh, there is a countable B that's actually an element of M that covers A. So now what I can do is I can find a single countable set that's an element of M and contains Zn 
for all of these n in omega minus x. So find a countable z in m such that zm is in z uh, for all n less than omega. Um, good. Um, or actually, I guess that's that's fine. But what I really want here is zn of a subset of z. Each zn is countable, so this is fine. Okay, but now we're sort of in trouble, right? Because let's go back to this note and apply this note to z. Okay, so b sub z, the set of m less than omega, such that uh, f z of m equals f y of m intersect z. Is in D. We can find some M, therefore, that'll simultaneously in B Z and the complement of this set X from the statement of the claim. Okay, but now uh, for such. Uh, n, f y of n intersect z n is going to be the same as f z of n intersect z n uh, because f z of n is precisely f y of n intersected with z. But everything on this right hand side is in m and so is definable in m. And so this intersection of f y of n with z n is also an m. But this is a contradiction to n line in the complement of x. OK. So that, that proves the claim. OK. Well, what's the upshot of this? So the upshot of this is that we have a lot of n's such that this ultra filter f y of n is m approximated. Uh, m is a guessing model. Therefore, for every such n in x, which I'll call x m, uh, there is an element of m, which I'll call v m n, such that uh, as far as m is concerned, uh, this v m n looks just like f y of n. Okay. But remember this f y of n was an m ultra filter. And now we have something that looks like an m ultra filter, but it's actually in m. So by elementarity, it's a real ultra filter. Okay. By elementarity, each of these v m n's is an ultra filter over kappa, and again by elementarity, I uh, countably complete ultra filter over kappa. All right. And we have this not just for this one guessing model M, but for all guessing models M. So we have all of these ultra filters, these countably complete ultra filters over kappa floating around. Uh, so now for each guessing model M, as above, uh, and each natural number N in this measure one set X sub M, Let's let gamma mn denote the completeness of vmn. Okay. Each of these ultra filters is countably complete. So this gamma mn is a measurable cardinal. Okay. So already we've proven something non-trivial. We've proven that there must exist measurable cardinals less than or equal to kappa in here. Okay, but now, now here's the claim that will finish the proof. Uh, the claim is the following. There is some guessing model M such that if I take the supremum of the completenesses 
of these ultra filters that I obtained in the above process uh, than I actually get kappa. Okay, so how will this complete the proof? Well, it's pretty much as before. So again, there are two cases. The first case, Kof kappa is greater than omega. Then this supremum of catalytic many things being kappa means one of them already was kappa. So there exists M such that VMM is kappa complete. Therefore, kappa is measurable. Okay, the other case, both kappa equals omega. Okay, uh, but now kappa is the limit of countably many measurable cardinals, namely gamma m m m x m. Okay, and these are the two possibilities we wanted to uh, show that, that kappa fell into. Okay, um, I'm not going to prove this claim. It's actually quite a bit of work goes into proving this, and it gets quite technical. Um, so I, I, I'm stripping over a lot of the proof here. Um, there's some interesting stuff there, but but I don't have time to say anything really intelligible about the claim uh, uh, in the seminar. Uh, but I think the, the overall idea and uh, sort of narrative of the proof should hopefully be, be legible from, from this. Okay. Um, good. So in the last few minutes, I want to say something about the optimality of this theorem. Uh, and I want to I want to give a sense in which this theorem is sharp. Okay. So here's another definition, sort of ad hoc. Um, there are much more general definitions about various degrees of indie plausibility, but just to state this sharpness theorem, let's make this sort of ad hoc definition, and say that a uniform ultrafilter U over a cardinal kappa, now greater than omega two, is omega two kappa indecomposable if for all lambda less than kappa and all functions f from kappa to lambda, there's a measure one set such that the pointwise image of this set under f has size at most omega one. So I've relaxed countable two of size omega one, just one cardinal left. Okay, so just sort of the next uh, step up and loosening the, the definition of indecomposability. Um, so what we were able to show is uh, the following. So if PFA holds, or our proof also works if Martin's maximum MM holds, uh, and kappa is a measurable cardinal, then there's a forcing extension in which PFA or MM still holds. Uh, kappa is inaccessible but not weakly compact and kappa carries an omega-2 kappa indecomposable ultrafilter. All right, so if we loosen the definition just this little bit, then uh, we do get compatibility with PFA and uh, even MM. Uh, so the idea of the proof is the following. So uh, as in this proof of, of Sheard's theorem, uh, we can assume the measurability of kappa is indestructible, is indestructible under adding a single Cohen subset to kappa. And now we force to add a witness to a certain weakening of uh, index square kappa omega one. Now, for sort of technical reasons, we can't actually force uh, this full property. We weaken it to uh, weaken the coherence requirements at ordinals of cofinality omega or omega one. Um, I don't want to state the exact property, but it. it is natural in light of the, the proof, I think. The reason that we need to do this weakening is in order to show that the corresponding forcing is actually uh, omega-2 directed closed. And as a result, it preserves PFA or MM if MM happened to hold. Uh, moreover, we can then consider doing a further forcing after adding this square sequence to add a thread through it, right? To add a club D, uh, and go back to the definition of, of index square. Uh, we want to sort of add generically 
a club D that would witness the failure to four. Namely, a club uh, in kappa that goes all the way up that coheres with my square sequence all the way. And it turns out that the two-step iteration of first adding the index square sequence and then adding a thread through it is equivalent to adding a single Cohen subset to kappa. And therefore, it resurrects the measurability of kappa. Uh, then what you can do is you can use a name for a kappa complete ultra filter over kappa in this two-step extension and sort of pull this name back to the intermediate extension. It obviously can't remain kappa complete there. We have this square sequence that's witnessing that kappa is not weakly compact. But you can show that it generates an omega-2 kappa in the decomposable ultra filter um, after only adding the index square sequence. Right, so this intermediate model is the model in which uh, PFA holds, and there's this cardinal that's not weakly compact, but carries this highly indecomposable ultra filter. Okay. Um, good. So maybe let me end with some questions. Um, there's this question that I already mentioned earlier about whether uh, a weakly compact cardinal that carries an indecomposable ultra filter must be measurable. Um, and I think this is a very interesting question. And I actually would not be that surprised if some of the techniques that we developed in our proof from PFA were applicable to shining some light on that question. Um, but I also want to ask the question uh, as follows. So note that, I mean, I didn't give the, the whole proof from PFA, but it was probably legible from it that the only amount of PFA we were using was, first of all, the guessing model property. And second of all, uh, at various points, we needed to assume that our cardinal kappa was larger than two to the omega one. Um, and so really all we needed for the conclusion was GMP plus kappa greater than two to the omega one. And so uh, you can also ask similarly, Okay, does the same conclusion follow from other prominent combinatorial consequences of PFA? Um, so in particular, I, I think the most natural one to ask would be the PIVL dichotomy. So the question would be, does the P ideal dichotomy? Uh, imply the same conclusion. So imply that any cardinal kappa carrying an indecomposable ultra filter is measurable or a countable uh, limit of measurable terms. All right. A limit of countably many measurable terms. Um, you could also ask the question from from MRP, the mapping reflection principle. Although I, I think this is probably uh, more promising from from PID. Um, I have no idea which why I would expect this question to go. I haven't spent any time thinking about it. Um, so, so who knows? Um, but it, it might be interesting. Um, okay, so I I think I'll end there. So thank you all for your attention. Oh, thank you very much for the talk. <laughs> very nice. Um, Thanks very yeah. much, Chris. Thanks. Actually, can I can I ask a question quick? Uh, yeah, of so course. You, you already addressed something that I had in my mind when you looked at this omega two uh, kappa in the combo uh, in the composability. So, I was just wondering if you, uh, let's say, instead of omega. Uh, in the original definition of in decomposability, you put some measurable cardinal theta, let's say. So, so you would say some some kappa is uh, theta in decomposable if you know uh, for every function that's bounded, you can find a measure one set uh, mm -hmm. where the pointwise image has size at most this theta, which is a measurable mm -hmm. cardinal below. But could you then do the run a similar argument and say like if lambda is a limit of theta many measurable cardinals, um, 
that right. yes that you could you could basically average over all the measures <laughs> using the measurable uh, the measure on that smaller measurable cardinal yes right? e yeah. exactly okay, okay. Yes, definitely That's and right. in fact um for simplicity i stated everything in in the sort of simplest case here but goldberg's theorem is much more general so okay. he proves that um like all he needs is something like if uh uh, let's see if I can get this right. Uh, if lambda is, um, let's say, theta strongly compact, mm -hmm. meaning that every lambda complete ultra filter can be completed to a theta complete, or every lambda complete filter can be completed to a theta complete ultra filter. So here, theta less than or equal to lambda. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and kappa greater than or equal to lambda carries uh, theta kappa in decomposable ultra filter, mm -hmm. which is exactly what you just right. said, mm -hmm. um, then uh, either kappa is measurable or uh, kappa is a singular limit of measurables uh, and profanality of kappa uh, is at most okay. or something something like this. I see. Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. Yeah. That's that's kind of exactly what I uh, mm -hmm. was wondering about. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. Any other questions for Chris? Uh, yeah, I, I have a question. And I think also a meta question. So the okay. question is, in various places, there's a conclusion that says kappa is the supremum of countably many measurable cardinals. Mm -hmm. In that case, as you pointed out at the very beginning, there's an easy way to construct an indecomposable ultra filter. Um, yes. I'm guessing that the that in that situation, you cannot guarantee that all the ultra, all the indecomposable ultra filters on kappa arise from that easy construction. So the easy construction is possible, but there may be other indecomposables. And then my meta question is, is that question the same essentially as the one you mentioned at one point as something you didn't know the answer to? about whether some ultra filter is in one of these done well-founded models of some sort. Um, mm -hmm. So I see. Um, I, see. I have no real idea about either of them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, OK. Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, I, I've thought briefly about your first question in the sense that I recognize it as an interesting question. I also don't know the answer to it at all. Um, but but I think it's definitely interesting to think about. Uh, I haven't thought about your second question at all. And I think that's that's interesting. Um, I I don't think it's exactly the same as this, this question about whether W is in MD. But it it's conceivable to me, at least, that um, under the guessing model property, the answer to your first question might actually conceivably be yes uh, by this sort of argument. Mm -hmm. Like the guessing model might sort of be able to show you that any ultra filter must come from, from this construction. Um, yeah, I, but I, I don't really have a concrete answer to either of your, your questions, except I, I think they're both quite interesting. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll just say, add one thing, uh, that the Hilbert was right, that life is good inside Cantor's paradise. Yeah. <laughs> okay. This talk shows it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I, I kind of ha have to head on to the next uh, seminar that's uh, starting here in a few minutes. Um, so I have to sign off. <laughs> Sorry, um, but thanks again, Chris, for this extremely interesting talk. Um, very yeah. nice. Yeah, thank you for the invitation and thank you all for your attention.